Yo, what's cracking, big dogs? We're going to do something a little bit different today. I'm, uh, one, just because I'm too lazy. I don't really feel like leaving bed. I'm still, uh, Jesus Christ. Sorry about that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to run through my Instagram because every Wednesday I put out a wild stat that's pertaining to fantasy football. Uh, that, that's kind of cool. And I know a lot of you guys probably aren't following me on Instagram. This is not like a plug to go follow me, but go follow me. BDGE underscore fantasy football. Every Wednesday I put out a wild stat that I found from the previous season or just in general, like history. So I kind of want to just run through them and talk about them. And you guys will probably find this one interesting. So I thought it'd be cool to share with you guys. And uh, we're just going to roll from the bottom and shoot up with it. That's cool with y'all. So DeAndre Hopkins. You look at his fantasy finishes last year in 2017, he played in 15 games. I want you to take away the consistency from what he did last season. He was a top 20 PPR fantasy receiver in 13 of 15 games, almost 90%. Like when you look at these numbers, it's staggering a top five. I know four out of 15 is not a lot, but top five finishes is very hard to do uh, even 27% of the time. So, DeAndre Hopkins is not a guy who just blew up last year, um, had big games, you know, and then kind of disappeared for you. He was one of the most consistent guys, and this was with and without uh, Deshaun Watson, obviously, and you know, I'll have Deshaun Watson back healthy. So if there was any doubt in your mind, I mean, these aren't these aren't stats that I put up to sway people one way or another. They're just like interesting wild stats that I find, and I think they're interesting to throw out there. So he never finished outside the top 40. But again, you can check all these out uh, on my Instagram, BDGE underscore fantasy football. I'm trying to keep that M&M ratio going. I'm not following anyone except for myself. You can go follow my personal Instagram as well. But every day of the week, I'm putting out uh, a different piece of value to you guys that you're not going to get on um, on YouTube. I do a, a bus pick every Friday, a sleeper pick every Saturday. And a uh, just a random question that I answer every Monday. I look at ADPs on Tuesday, so it's a useful it's a useful little uh, piece for you guys. I try to give you value on all these different platforms and do it in different ways. So we're just going to do wild stats today, and myself is the only one I follow. So when you see these weird little personal picks, it's just my personal Instagram. Where are we at? Where's the next wild stat Wednesday? Wild stat Wednesday. Okay, so this is a pretty good one. Last year, Todd Gurley led the NFL in PPR fantasy points per game. I'm talking about every single position, quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends. He was the league leader. He averaged 25.8 fantasy points per game. It is the first time since 2006 that a non-quarterback finished number one in this statistic. In 26, it was LaDainian Tomlinson, Larry Johnson, and Steven Jackson all did the damn thing. All did the damn thing. Steven Jackson's so underrated, yo. That guy was such a beast. You ever watch the uh, the Lord of the Rings? I don't watch the Lord of the Rings, but my friends have made me watch it every now and then. Um, the first one when when they're just starting off on their journey, right? And they gotta they gotta hide in the crevice of the tree, and that one fucking huge beast dude like looks over them. He's like he's painted in all black. That guy looks like Steven Jackson. I gotta find. Dude, this is going to piss me off now. What are they, orcs? I don't know if they're orcs. Yeah, like this motherfucker. No, that ain't really him. Who's the orc leader, is it? Yeah, this guy. You know this guy when he's standing over that tree? Yup. Yup. That's not Steven Jackson. Then I don't know what a Steven Jackson is. Um... Why am I off on this tangent? I don't know anymore. Oh, yeah. So Todd Gurley. He had a pretty good day in the year last year. Where's the next wild stat? Where we at, though? Where we at, though? <sighs> okay. So looking at red zone targets. Cooper Cup led NFL wide receivers last year in red zone targets. Is the first rookie to ever do that. Well, this is... Going back to 2000 only, I don't have statistics prior to 2000 on red zone statistics, but uh, he was the only wide receiver to do it from at least 2000, probably even earlier, to lead all wide receivers in red zone targets. He had 26 of them. 
Uh, and you know what? I think this might be outdated because I remember making the stat and then a few weeks later looking at it. Let me check real quick. Nope, that ain't it. I wanted to look at the Redland targets, and I went back, and I think they updated the numbers. Yeah, so Cooper Cup is not actually the leader anymore. I don't know why they, they'll randomly have them in and then um, – and then update them, and they're not right anymore. But here you go. Cooper Cup is – so he was tied for second amongst wide receivers in red zone targets. Either way, kind of discredits my stat, but at least I'm following up with the real news. Um, he was right there in red zone targets. Take that for what you won't. Busted Friday. Where we at, though? Wild Stat Wednesday. This is a good one, too. I actually did this one twice. So over the last 10 NFL seasons – there have only been four rookie quarterbacks to have finished as a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. They were Dak Prescott in 2016, finished as QB6, Andrew Luck in 2012, and RG3 in 2012. They were QB8 and 5, respectively, and Cam Newton in, well, that actually says 20,111. But 2011, when Cam was a rookie, finished as QB3. Every one of these quarterbacks finished as a top 10 fantasy quarterback in their rookie year. But more importantly, every one of them finished their rookie season with at least 255 rushing yards and at least five rushing touchdowns. The average amongst their four seasons was 520 rushing yards and eight rushing touchdowns. You hear that? The average 520 and eight rushing touchdowns. So the takeaway here is that if you're thinking about drafting a rookie quarterback for redraft at least, they need to have rushing upside good rushing upside. Otherwise, they are not going to be a QB1 for you in fantasy football. Oh, this is a good one that I dug deep for. I feel like this didn't get enough goddamn appreciation. This is around draft time, and I wanted, I kind of wanted to talk about how people were saying Saquon Barkley was a really bad pick at number two because the RB position was overvalued in terms of what they actually bring to a team and the success that a team could have. Oh, let's get comfortable, baby. So in the last 30 years, there have been 19 running backs who have been a top five pick in the NFL draft. Of those 19 running backs, they've combined to play in 151 NFL seasons. So all of them, their career seasons combined together is 151 NFL seasons. Only three of those 151 NFL seasons resulted in a Super Bowl, which is less than 2%. None of those three running backs have won multiple Super Bowls. So out of 151 seasons, top five NFL draft pick running backs have resulted in three Super Bowl wins. This is over the last 30 years. That was Reggie Bush in 2010, Jamal Lewis in 2001, Marshall Falk in 2000. Um, I think it just goes to kind of show what a top five rookie running back adds to the team in terms of them winning a championship. And it's probably not much. Obviously, if you have the pieces in place around it, it could be a huge help to it. Like Jamal Lewis probably carried that team to the Super Bowl, but uh, it's very unlikely. Do, 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 do. Bow, bow, bow. Okay. So we were looking at, you know, after the Jerick McKinnon trade happened, San Francisco last year threw the ball. They threw a pass on 56% of their first and second down plays, which was fifth highest in the NFL. Minnesota threw a pass on just 44.8% of their first and second down plays, which was dead last in the NFL. This is per Sharp Stats. It's a guy named Walter Sharp who does crazy, crazy work on his website. I'll bring it up here. It's completely free for you guys to look at. I've mentioned this on my site a few times. Where you at? Oh, sharp stat, sharpfootballstats.com. He has all these crazy, crazy, crazy in, in-depth stats that you can go through and look at in terms of pass run ratio. Um, there's just like a million other things that you can you can sort through on here. Rushing, receiving, the efficiency, you know, all these crazy things. So if you want to check that out, definitely do that. Um, but this was talking about when Jarek McKinnon moved over and the reports yesterday were early and they were talking about how crazy uh McKinnon looked in the passing game at practice already and he's going to be one of Garoppolo's probably favorite targets um so even if you're worried about him being small or not playing on all three downs that's fine because they throw the ball a lot in first and second down and that is where McKinnon is going to 
Hey. McKinnon, baby. Where we at, though? Okay. Another wild stats. Here we go. From 2013 to 2016, Julian Edelman has played in 10 playoff games. In four years, 10 playoff games. His per game numbers in those 10 playoff games, 12.6 targets, 8 receptions, 104.4 total yards, and 4 total touchdowns. He had never caught less than 5 passes in any of those 10 games. He had double-digit targets in 10, 9 of 10 games, and he racked up 84-plus targets in 8 of those 10 games. Oh, God. Julian Edelman. Man, he's going to be a... a, a a really good sleeper pick this year in drafts if he if he drops in your like home league people forget about him still one of Brady's favorite targets so don't forget about you boy Cammy 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 Cam I think a lot of people are probably going to be off on Cam this year um I mean he's a shitty thrower we know that but his running is just is just too present it's just too juicy for you not to love, especially if you play in a league where it's four point per passing touchdown and it's not weighed so heavily on their throwing performance, like a six point per passing touchdown league. Cam is a fantastic pick from weeks one to five last year. And this remember he came back in when he was a little banged up with the shoulder and he just he didn't look good whatsoever. He attempted five point eight rushes a game and was averaging 18 rushing yards a game. But from week six to 17, that bumped up to 10 rushes a game, 66.4 rushing yards a game. We saw him really come into his own, and he was a dominant fantasy performer over the final, was that 11, 12 weeks of the NFL season. Those 110 rushing attempts over the last 11 or 12 games, I can't seem to do the math for some reason, uh, from week 6 to 17 were more than any quarterback over the entire course of the season. So just that time frame was more than any quarterback in the in the whole season. Russell Russell Wilson was the second leading rusher on the year. He had 95 total rushing attempts. So Cam from 6 to 17 outrushed every quarterback for the entire year. So girl, yeah, Cam. Cam and baby. Wild Sat Wednesday. Oh, and this, you know, I'm going to actually take some time on this one. Because this is something that you guys need to understand when it comes to drafting in the early rounds. And I'm actually going to pull up an awesome, awesome tweet that uh, I think Pat Thorman from PFF might have tweeted out yesterday. Guys, this is this is huge when it comes to drafting in the first and second round. Um, and this will be something I touch on in my draft guide in further depth. So um, just, just stay with me for a sec while I pull this up. Okay. Let me go with mine first. Which is bullshit because I did this like months ago and now he's going to obviously take credit because he's got more pull in the damn industry. But it is what it is, what it is, what it is. So I went back and looked at the last, what was this, eight years. Now I took the top five fantasy finishers at both running back and at, and at wide receiver. Uh, and I wanted to look at how how many fantasy points they finished with on, on, an, on an average season. So in, for instance, in 2017, I looked at the top five finishers for running backs in terms of half point PPR and the average top five guy finished with 290 fantasy points. So that's saying like between Gurley, Bell, Kamara, whatever, each of them on average finished with 290, right? And I did that with running backs, did that with wide receivers, the top five for each position. And you look back historically and you see that top five fantasy running backs absolutely dominate top five fantasy wide receivers in terms of where they finish in terms of overall points. The only exception here, I think it was, yeah, I have the numbers probably in the description here. So over the last eight seasons, the average top five fantasy running back finishes the season with 24 more total fantasy points than the average top five fantasy wide receiver, right? That's almost, that's almost two full fantasy points per game. And that includes the outlier year of 2015, right? That was the year we saw the, uh, the zero RB thing become such a uh, a big theory in fantasy football and it was kind of twofold right because it wasn't just like all the running backs went down and all the top running backs like performed or got hurt or got old or whatever it was right like Marshawn Lynch, Jamal Charles, Adrian Peterson, all that shit and Eddie Lacy um it coupled with the fact that the wide receivers had a have an outlier year on their end like look at the points it's 288 compared that was the highest of this eight year run um so that's why everyone went into 2016 drafting wide receivers and if you drafted running backs you were Gucci, right? 
Um, so if you take out that 2015, you're looking at 35.4 more points for a top five running back than a top five fantasy wide receiver. So it goes to show you that like the elite running backs on average outproduce the elite wide receivers by a pretty heavy margin. And that should be a tiebreaker for you guys. Um, even if you like a guy like maybe DeAndre Hopkins or or Michael Thomas or Julio Jones, right? Like you like them, but you're trying to decide between a workhorse bell cow back. Uh, I, that itself would make me lean towards running backs in the early rounds. And then I saw this tweet from Scott Barrett. You can go follow him. He's a very good follow on Twitter. Over the, fa- the past 15 seasons, nine of the top 10 highest scoring PPR seasons were from running backs. You guys could read. Y'all Y'all are smart enough to find my channel. Y'all are probably smart enough to, to read. I'm sure y'all are literate. If not, I'm sorry to hear that. So that's just interesting. Over the past 15, this is even more interesting. On a points per game basis, uh, 10 of 10 of the highest scoring PPR seasons were from running backs. Almost all of them came from running backs in terms of top 15, top 30, top 40. Um, But the points per game basis obviously is a little more skewed because the argument is that running backs get hurt a lot more than wide receivers. And that was another narrative for the zero RB theory. But overall, I would say that it, you know, it's, um, it's just, it's just a good draft strategy. I know you like Odell Beckham if he falls to whatever pick um, things like that. And I still, it's not like I'm completely punting the wide receiver position, but it's just something to think about when it comes to a tiebreaker in the first and second round of things. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go much more in depth on that in my draft guide when I do the BDGE Bible, which is my big article at the end of the draft guide, which is an overall strategy, like position by position, round by round, that kind of thing. So if you have not yet pre-ordered my draft guide, I highly suggest you do so. So you're prepped for your draft this summer. Um, you can find it link in the description. I'll link it up, up the top, right, right now it's pre-order price until July 1st, the price will go up on July 1st. So make sure you snag that. Oh, what a, oh, this was the goat picture. Look at that caption. Instagram. Instagram. Someone brought out, I was at a party in New York. Someone brought out graham crackers. I went wild. I love graham crackers. I don't know why. Eh, who doesn't love graham crackers, though? Okay. Wow, this is a lot to take in here. So pretty much what I wanted to look at was, you know, don't even look at the, don't even look at the graph right now. Just, just listen to me. I wanted to see because Tyreek Hill had had a year last year, right, where he um, – oh, I, I, uh, I wrote that wrong. So, anyways, uh, Tyreek Hill had a year last year where he finished really good as a fantasy wide receiver, right, wide receiver eight. And over the last four years – or not over the last four years, over the last 15 years, there have only been four wide receivers – that have gotten less than 105 targets and finish as a top 10 fantasy wide receiver, right? And that's what Tyree Kill did here. He's one of four wide receivers over the last 15 years to do it. It was Tyree Kill, Doug Baldwin, Jordy Nelson, Mike Wallace. So I wanted to take those first three guys that had such big years on small target sample sizes or small targets overall, and I wanted to look at the following year. So under like, you see like Mike Wallace 2010, N plus one is just Mike Wallace for the, and then the following year. So it'd be Mike Wallace 2011. I wanted to see how they performed in the next year. Was it kind of fluky? Um, because obviously if you have a low target total, right under 105, but you perform like a huge fantasy wide receiver, there's probably an outlier somewhere. And we did find that right for Jordy Nelson. He had 15 touchdowns in that year. Doug Ball went 14, which was the case. Mike Wallace is a really long deep threat. So he had a ton of uh, deep threats. I'm not sure what his yards per reception was, but it was probably really high. And I wanted to look at, what happened the next year, right? If it was fluky or if these guys were actually there to stay. So it could help us kind of predict with Tyreek Hill. Um, So what I found was Wallace, Jordy, and Dougie all finished the following year a little bit lower in terms of fantasy finishes. And all of them had less touchdowns. But as I've talked about already this offseason plenty, you shouldn't be depending on wide receivers who depend on touchdowns. Interestingly, though, all of them saw an uptick in targets per game the following season. It makes sense, right? Teams are going to be like, damn, this guy pretty damn good. He was really efficient on a low target total. Let's give him more targets. That's why they had more targets per game, right? It makes sense. The interesting thing here is that Hill's ability to finish so high on the low target total that he had uh, only came with seven touchdowns, right? So he did it through receptions. He did it through yards. And he did it through like a mediocre number of touchdowns. 
Um, the other three happened to average 13 touchdowns during their top 10 year between Wallace, Nelson, and Baldwin, while Tariq Hill only had seven. So um, Hill looks like a guy who could do it on a low target total, right? He doesn't need to be a touchdown monster in order to kind of produce where he was last year. I mean, obviously, you have to think of the new quarterback. You have to think of Sammy Watkins coming in at wide receiver. But if Hill could see around 100 targets again, I don't think that's a crazy number for him to to for him to be seeing again this year why can't he put up these numbers again because it's not like it's not like he had 102 targets last year and he scored 14 touchdowns which are obviously not going to be repeatable but he only had seven touchdowns I think that's something that he could probably do again so um this is a stat that might make you think twice about whether or not you are bailing on Hill so um if Hill had scored like 13 touchdowns last year he would have finished as wide receiver three behind just Antonio Brown and D Hop. In the Muck Mondays. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, this is just an overall weird, crazy, wild stat that I wanted to look at the fantasy football industry as a whole. And in my draft guide, guys, you're going to get exclusive blog posts and videos that I uh, that I don't put out on YouTube or I don't put out on my blog. One of them is a big article about the fantasy sports and fantasy football industry as a whole. I go pretty in depth and I talk about all these crazy stats and the trends and the industry and where it's going and and things like that. Uh, so that's going to be an article in the draft guide. Another reason why y'all should check that out. Um, as of the Fantasy Sports Trade Association's meeting in June of 2017, the fantasy sports industry is worth over seven point two billion dollars. Twenty one percent of the U.S. population plays fantasy sports. In 2016, the cannabis industry was worth seven point two billion dollars. By the end of 2018, the estimated worth of virtual reality plus augmented reality industries combined will come out to a a worth of around $7 billion. So fantasy sports is as valuable, if not more valuable, than cannabis and VR and AR. As of now, obviously both of those ones are going to shoot up in in the near future because they're on the rise, but it's, it's staggering nonetheless. Um, so like I said, 21% of the entire U S population plays fantasy sports. 73% of these people play fantasy football players over the age of 18 are spending on average $556 each year on fantasy sports. And you might think like, no way, that's not me, but think about all your league buy-ins. Think about any draft parties that you have. You have to buy the draft board, food, drinks, things that go along with it. Think about what, if your league does, um, championship belts, trophies, rings. Think about if you have a loser punishment, daily fantasy sports factors into that. If you throw like 50 bucks on DFS uh, weekly or whatever. Oh, and speaking of, if you buy championship belts, rings, trophies, look at me in the bottom left corner, people. I want to say thank you to the video sponsor today. It is fantasyjocks.com. They are the world leader. Yeah, goddamn right. The world leader in championship belts, trophies, rings, for your fantasy league as well as draft boards. Grab it now. They have discounted prices on their draft board kits. Fantasyjocks.com. Have everyone chip in. Five bucks, ten bucks. You get this crazy ass belt for your league. I'm telling you, these are gorgeous quality. Get one of them for your leagues. Have everyone chip in a little bit. Yeah, I'm in I'm working in boxes right now. It's nice to work from home, right? Life pretty good out here. So yeah, fantasyjocks.com. Thank you for sponsoring the video. Make sure you check them out. You could also engrave each team that wins each year. Championship team on that belt. Had that thing forever. It's the best way to actually get your, your league more engaged and more involved is having something to play for. What else we got? Oh. Um. Yo, we also got some new, some new sweatshirts up on the site. If y'all are into uh, any of you G- G-Man fans, we got a little Baquan action up there. I'm trying to get together some witty... Some witty team logo shirts, names, whatever like that. So if you got any funny ones revolving around your team, it could be a player, it could be a coach, it could be the city itself. I don't really care. Hit me up with it. Let me know, and I'll, I'll make a sweatshirt out of it. What are the wild stats we got? Yeah, look at your boy. Looking ripped. Wild stat Wednesday. What do we got here? Okay, these are, uh, if you look over here. On the right, you see these numbers. These are receptions per game. And this is from 2016 to 2017. 
So Antonio Brown is averaging 7.1 receptions per game over those two years. The stat I was pointing out was Le'Veon Bell being on this list. Le'Veon Bell is basically a wide receiver. Only seven guys have averaged more receptions per game than Le'Veon Bell. Look at that. He's averaged nearly six receptions. And Julian Edelman only played one of those years, so that could be even skewed further. Um, so, yes, Le'Veon Bell has averaged the seventh, eighth most receptions per game over the last two years. He's not a damn wide receiver. This shit is crazy. This shit is brazy. Le'Veon Bell for president. Um, where are we at, though? Wild Stat Wednesday. I think this might have been last week's. Top five fantasy quarterbacks over the last seven seasons. So I went back over the last seven fantasy seasons, and I looked at top five fantasy quarterback finishes. Only seven in seven seasons. Wow, I spelled seasons wrong. That's so disrespectful to the season gods. Only seven quarterbacks that have finished as a top five fantasy quarterback have thrown for less than 4,000 yards in that season. It was like, let me see, it was Cam. Cam was four of the seven finishes. He did it four times. Russell Wilson did it twice, and RG3 did it once back in 2012. So for the most part, unless you got Cam or RW, shouldn't rely too much on fantasy runners unless, actually, I mean, they could they could be a good play week to week if you're looking for like a top 12 guy, but not a top five guy. And I think that wraps up, yeah, because this would lead to today. Today is Wednesday. I'll have my next Wild Stat Wednesday posting today. I forget what the stat is, but I have it on an Excel chart somewhere. Um, so if you're not following me on Instagram and you want to see what today's Wild Stat is, make sure you do that. BDGE underscore fantasy football. That's my fantasy one. You can obviously follow my personal one if you want to see me do ignorant stuff all the time. I got to f- answer these women over here. Cindy Starbucks. Yeah, so this yesterday, I'm sitting in Starbucks doing work. And there's this really cute barista that works at, at Starbucks. And she did it like she had been working there the whole time I was there. I was there for a few hours. And she walks by me in the bathroom's right in front of me. She goes into the bathroom and then she comes out with a piece of paper and it's her name and her number on it. She's like, this is for you. She's legit dropped her name and number and gave it to me. And, uh, and now obviously your boy slid in, slid into the text messages, but She's mad cute. I'm excited about that. I felt like Vinny Chase and Entourage, like girls just coming up to him and like dropping numbers down on the table. I was like, damn, this is epic. She's cute as hell. I was like, I was totally into her and I was going to try to um, hit on her, but she done hit on me first. Shoot or shoot, I guess, man. Shoot or sh- shoot, or shoot, baby. Um, yeah, so I'm done rambling over here. So if you want to follow me on the gram, pre-order the draft guide. Um, thumb the video up if you enjoyed it, guys. Please, please subscribe to the channel if you're new. Uh, also, this is on podcast. We're, we're on a podcast here, too. So if you want to check out the podcast, it's just BDGE, Fantasy Football, leaving ratings and review. I'm trying to take over the top spot. I'm trying to blow out of the water ESPN, Yahoo, all them frauds that are in the fantasy football industry right now. We're trying to take over. This is the summer. Big Dogs takes over, baby. So that's it for today. Thumb up the video if you enjoyed, because I know I did. I didn't really even enjoy this video. I've just been sitting in bed. I'm lazy as hell. I'm so annoying. I would never listen to my videos if I were you guys. What am I doing? Okay, let's time to get this day rolling. Peace.